was always drawn towards novels that used photographs of major historical traumas. And I realized that more and more my questions and my interest were really in the documentation, the visual documentation of historical traumas. Um, and so I, I would be on really working closely with photojournalists who do this. I think, I mean, I still have a love, a deep love of literature. I think that kind of plays out in my current work because photos are a form of storytelling or they can be used to tell stories. War photography. We've seen the captivating images in magazines like Time and National Geographic. Lauren Walsh is a professor at NYU. Her new book discusses conflict photography and the dangers that come with it. She visited Georgia State University to tell us more. Let's take a look. My interest in photography began a long time ago. I think it actually goes back to high school. A teacher took me and some of my student peers on a trip to see a photography show at a museum in New York City. And it was the first time I had really paid attention to photography um, as because it was up on the wall and it was in a museum. And I realized that documenting moments with a camera can have real impact. In this case, there was a lot of emotional impact for me as the viewer. That piqued an interest early on. And then I continued to study photography, so high school, college. My doctoral work is actually in literature, but I was really interested in literature that brought photographic images into the pages. And then I finished grad school, got a job at NYU, and I initially was teaching courses on text and image, so things like what, what I was doing in my doctoral work, like novels that had photos. But I was always drawn towards novels that used photographs of major historical traumas. And I realized that more and more my questions and my interest were really in the documentation, the visual documentation of historical traumas. Um, and so I, I would be on really working closely with photojournalists who do this. I think, I mean, I still have a love, a deep love of literature. I think that kind of plays out in my current work because photos are a form of storytelling or they can be used to tell stories. So now my classes focus very much on either the history of photojournalism or coverage of places in conflict or crisis, or I run a photojournalism lab at NYU Gallatin, um, and even there, and that's much more of a how to use your camera, how to document, how to put together the images, but one of the things that is a really uh, heavily emphasized in that program is the idea of ethical, responsible documentary practice. So I'm, I'm frequently thinking about either photojournalism and its vital role in showing us what is happening in people, to people or in places around the world, and I'm also thinking about ethics and like how does the what does it mean to look at these pictures how can we do it ethically the images that have become iconic over time are the ones that tend to capture a moment of drama or heightened emotion they're images that stand the test of time so a viral image is not the same as an iconic image an iconic image needs time to pass I say that also because an iconic image over time will have some of its details stripped away from it. So one image that many Americans know is Migrant Mother. Um, and it's this photograph taken during the Great Depression. It shows a woman, uh, two of her children are kind of nestled next to her and she's holding a baby. It's a very iconic photograph. Most people can't tell you the name of the photographer. Most people can't tell you the year it was taken. Most people can't tell you where it was taken, but they can tell you this is an iconic image and it stands for the Great Depression, right? So iconic images tend to take on much larger histories and encapsulate them in a single moment. Conflict photography traditionally would be, you might use the term war photography, right? And it's the 
photojournalists who go to cover spaces of war. I am much more interested in the term conflict, um, which I chose specifically when I was doing my book on conflict photography, because I want to look at the photography that exists not only in spaces of war, but also humanitarian crisis, not only on front lines, but also pulling back from front lines and looking at how civilians in a space of war are impacted. Um, I think conflict also occurs in the form of economic conflict, social conflict, political conflict. So I have a pretty broad definition of conflict photography, and it's the photojournalists who are working to show those stories. I'm working on a documentary film right now and one of the photographs highlighted in the film, it's called Biography of Photo, and one of the photographs was taken in Panama in 1989. And the photographer who took the picture was about 23 years old at the time. He went to Panama thinking, I'm going to document an election, right? So there was a dictator running the country, holding elections kind of to prove to the world that he was actually a nice dictator and people should back off. Turns out he wasn't a very nice dictator. And the party that won the election was the opposition party, not the dictator's party. Um, so the dictator immediately nullified the results of the election, which prompted the winning individuals and their supporters to kind of take to the streets to say, this was a rightfully held election, we rightfully won it. And it got violent. The photographers there didn't expect that there was going to be this violence. So the winners of the election were driving a caravan through the city streets in the capital of Panama, which is called Panama City. And as they approach one of the squares, you know, plaza, they're surrounded by paramilitary supporters of the dictator. All manner of violence is unleashed, kind of sticks are being smashed in people, metal pipes, people are getting hit, guns are being um, fired. And so the photographer uh, who took the picture in Panama, it's a very famous photograph, and it's a picture of the elected vice president covered in blood, and he's being attacked by a paramilitary supporter of the dictator. And the photographer has said, I had absolutely no training for a situation like this. I could hear bullets whizzing. I just tried to stay very focused on the moment. And the moment came and went really fast, right? It wasn't um, a sustained space of violence, but it was still very violent. And uh, at least one person died there that day. And that photographer is Ron Haviv. He almost says it was kind of a trial by fire. Like, I really had not prepared for this. If I were to talk to any of my photojournalism students today, um, and I had a conversation very recently with a former student of mine who went to Ukraine to cover, my approach is don't do trial by fire. Get training, get prepared. Um, there are workshops that didn't exist when this photographer was working in Panama. Um, but there are now workshops that train journalists for hostile environments so that they can be as best equipped as possible to respond to the circumstances. So these are specific courses and workshops, um, and they're called either HEFAT or HEAT, and it stands for Hostile Environment Awareness Training. They can be really intense and t last for days. Uh, during the pandemic, a lot of these organizations had to conduct these kinds of trainings online. And some of the primary things that you're teaching them are first aid, right? Like, what's a tourniquet and how do you use it? Because you've got a few minutes to save someone's life or maybe your own if they're bleeding that badly. There's first aid training. There's training for just the stress of being in a very volatile situation. And volatile situations don't have to be just war zones, right? Like protests here in the United States got really heated at times. So training for dealing with that. They are training you for kind of a psychological, like how do I maneuver through this? And it's a lot of, um, you know, tactical. Like if you're going to walk into a war zone, what kind of bulletproof vest should you have? What kind of helmet should you have? Um, it's kind of trying to get journalists to be prepared for all of that before they walk into a setting where things could be dangerous. Citizen journalism pl has played um, a major role. Uh, and I, you know, the go-to or most recent one would be 
George Floyd, right? The imagery created by a citizen and, and a teenager at right. that, right? And, and I think of it as visual documentation that I think changed the course of history. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of the protester who is documenting the protest, I think it's great, like creating documentation. I don't think it all necessarily qualifies as journalism. And one of the things that a number of journalists were telling me in terms of the coverage of protest was that the protesters were putting journalists in danger, right? If protesters are doing things that are going to kind of get a police reaction, police were then kind of summarily scooping up everybody. And one of the photographers who I interviewed for that book gave a situation where he said, this is the first time I had seen this, but a bunch of activists had labeled themselves as press. And they were walking around kind of under the cover of being press, but they weren't. And they were doing dangerous things. You know, you can't like pick up a rock and throw it at a police officer and not expect a reaction. So he said things got very messy and it put journalists in danger. So I started my book through the lens early in spring 2020. And at the time I was um, isolated I'm in New York, we were in a lockdown, but I was looking of course at the visual coverage and I was talking to a lot of my photo colleagues about their work um, and whether they were going out and what that felt like because I really was leading a very contained life. And one of the things that I was hearing from a number of photojournalists was that the story was incomplete, that the pictures that were showing up in the news were showing us part of it, but they weren't getting inside hospitals. They weren't getting close enough to, at least in New York, we had um, refrigerator trucks that were used as temporary morgues. And the media, pe people I talked to felt like, I'm not able to document the real severity of what's happening. You know, May 25th, 2020, the world changed in a different way, right? So George Floyd gets murdered and protests erupt and I'm watching all of this unfold. And so the idea of any kind of quarantine or isolation went completely out the window with those protests. And all of a sudden you're in the middle of a pandemic and bringing all sorts of people together. And the protests raised new and different questions for photojournalists. So for the first time, Photojournalists were routinely being asked by protesters to not show their faces. So I was just thinking through all of these issues that were occurring all at once and talking to colleagues about it. And eventually and pretty quickly, I realized this is happening to all of us. Like we've all lived through the pandemic. We've all at minimum heard of George Floyd, um, if not been to or watched BLM protests. And the way these events get covered has ramifications for all of our lives. So that was an impetus to put this together as a book and get the book out so that people can think through these issues. I mean, if we think to the recent crises, right, recent conflicts that have occurred, social media has pros and cons, I guess. On the one hand, um, if you are a local Iraqi photographer who didn't necessarily have a contract with a major Western organization, you can now put your images out. You can get an audience. People can see your local perspective. I think in that sense, social media has been very beneficial. I think there are ways in which it's also, there's a lot of things to be wary of. There's the question of citizen journal, like is what I'm looking at real or not? And how do I have any way to know? I think there's also just sometimes a diminished effect. It's one thing to see a full page, front page, horrific photo of a space of war, and it's another to scroll past that same image sandwiched between you know, somebody's vacation photo and their cute dog photo, and you're spending half a second looking at the image. I think the, the context in which we receive these images can change how we react to them or what we understand from them. I think those are just a few of the elements that we can think about with social media, but I would not necessarily kind of say social media has been awful. Like I think there are some real pros to it. And I think even just the fact that I think you can capture younger audiences before they would maybe necessarily be 
subscribing to the New York Times um, or going to newyorktimes.com, they're going to be on social media. So I think you can have a younger exposure to news stories as well. And like it or not, and I know that people are divided on this, um, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, they're, they're here for now and they are part of the news landscape. So I think kind of just becoming savvier about how to use those platforms is going to be better for all of us. There's more effort today to not only focus on the image, but also who took the image. Is there diversity behind the camera? Are photographers choosing to change the perspective regarding stereotypes? Let's find out. Traditionally, journalism was more of a male-dominated field, and traditionally, photojournalism was more of a male-dominated field. And the major media entities traditionally have been Western, right? So you kind of have this tipping towards Western white male. This has come under much more critique in the recent past, this awareness of an imbalance. So there is more of an effort today, I think, to pay attention to not just what's the image, but who took the picture, right? Is there a diversity in the newsroom? Are you working with local photographers who understand the situation at a deeper level or who speak the language of a local population? What does it mean to have kind of a balance between Western and non-Western men and women. So it's still an imbalanced landscape, there's no question. And I think that that goes for journalism at large. It certainly applies to war correspondence, which historically is a kind of more macho thing to do. But it has shifted in the recent years. Um, if you want to be a conflict photographer, well, first, like, learn your gear, your camera. Second, please deeply consider the ethics of taking pictures. I think that should be everyone's starting point as a journalist, and I think the stakes are really high when you're documenting someone's refugee crisis or someone's, you know, the death of their child. It's that much more that's going on in the lives of the people that you're documenting. So I think technical considerations you need, ethical considerations you need, Certainly, I would say you need safety training to be there. And I would also say, if you really want to be a conflict photographer, and if you really want to go to somebody else's conflict, ask yourself why. Why do I need to go to someone else's situation to take these pictures? And if you find an answer that justifies why you need to go and take these pictures, and, and there, there can be answers, you need to understand the landscape, you need to understand the history, you need to understand the culture. If it's a foreign culture to you, you're likely going to be working with locals and you need to make sure that you're as respectful of the local journalists um, and protective of them because local journalists often face greater hazards than foreign journalists and foreign journalists have passports and can leave and local journalists get stuck behind. So. There's a whole other host of ethical considerations that aren't inside the picture itself, but which I would say anyone who wants to do this kind of work should be thinking through. And then the final thing I would say is, <laughs> there's really in today's media landscape no such thing as the war photographer anymore. Um, and if you think you're going to pay the bills by conflict photography alone, mm -hmm. your bills have to be really pretty low. There are um, lofty aims with covering conflict, but I think it's equally lofty to be a journalist who focuses on his or her own community. And you're not just going to do conflict photography. Like, you have to be open-minded to other forms of photojournalism as well. As far as how has covering conflict affected photographers' mental health, I think nearly every photographer who I've spoken to would say it has had an impact on their mental health. And I would fold into that covering crises right here in the United States, whether it's pandemic or the murder of a black man. These can also take serious emotional tolls on the journalists. And so I think that's something that, that should very much be part of newsroom culture, an awareness that the camera doesn't block you. It doesn't make you numb. It doesn't turn off what's happening. And even if you think you can turn it off, it's going to seep in, and it's going to have an effect on you. Um, 
And so it depends. Like I've spoken with photojournalists who've gone to far away places and see a lot of death and they have to work with a professional and work through situations like that. I spoke with a photojournalist here in the United States. She's from Minneapolis. She's a black woman and covering Minneapolis in 2020 took a real toll. It was really hard. She said, this was my community and a bunch of white supremacists showed up and they were threatening and harassing the press. So that also, it's a different situation. One of the images that I find so distressing for me in the conflict photography book, and I have looked at many, many, many images of conflict and suffering. There is a picture of a woman. She is a Rohingya uh, and she was fleeing Myanmar and she makes it to Cox's Bazar. It's an area of Bangladesh where many Rohingya fled uh, because they were, it was kind of state sanctioned murders, uh, genocides, uh, genocide that was occurring there. And she arrives in what is supposed to be her next space, right? It's supposed to be at least a respite from what happened before. And as her boat is coming in, her infant child drowns. So it's a photograph of a woman holding her dead baby. And that to me was really hard. And maybe it's because I'm a mother, but I think it speaks across the board. It's a really tough photograph. And for whatever reason, I find that image more emotionally challenging than bloody images, than graphic images of another sense. So I think there's a power that can come in very sensational imagery and a power that can come in very emotional imagery. If I'm jumping to my other book, one of the images that I find most powerful is the one that you reference, the father and son. And I really love the way the photographer talks about that image. And I really love that it's nothing violent about it at all, but she's still putting it in dialogue with a very serious social political situation in the United States today. And she is just saying, it's time to reframe the visual narrative. Look at this image. So I find that one powerful in a, a really smart, thoughtful way that it adds to the typical visuals that we see about black men and Black Lives Matter. Fact or fake? Today, photographers can do both. That brings up the topic of ethics. I mean, I think some of the things that are not very good things that we have to worry about are ever more ways to manipulate images and create deep fakes. And these, are, these fake things are gonna be in competition with real credible journalism. There is also uh, an initiative called the Content Authenticity Initiative, which is rolling out right now. And it's supposed to be a new standard um, for photos, for cameras, for journalism that essentially protects the integrity and the provenance of an image. And I, I won't get into all the specifics of how it works, but that is one way going forward of trying to maintain the integrity in a world where deep fakes are gonna start coming out. As far as conflict photography, maybe in a more general sense, I suppose it's a little bit the glass half empty. I don't think we're gonna live in a world that doesn't see conflict. So I do think we're going to continue to need conflict photographers who can bear witness and document and show us what's happening and create evidence so that in those horribly unfortunate situations where, let's say, war crimes are committed, you can at least hold someone accountable for what they've done. I've been in touch with people um, primarily in Kyiv, which is the capital, and also in Lviv, which is in the West. I'll be doing a phone call or a Zoom, and every so often the person will say, Shh, I hear some shelling, mm -hmm. or I hear something. I want to make sure it's outgoing, not incoming. So, which means also this is a story that's going to go on for a long time. And that then raises questions for the photojournalist. Like you start to get tired, like physically tired, but also that emotional tired. Like every day you get up and you go cover a funeral or you go cover an apartment building that was shelled the night before, or you go 
and you take pictures of people fleeing across a bombed up bridge and you know they're carrying one bag which is the only bag they get to take with them as they flee for their lives like this the repeated exposure to this um, starts to starts to take a toll so I tend to like I have I talk to people a lot right and I think just talking is very good I personally also find being a teacher I find it a, a privilege and it's very restorative to be around students who aren't so focused on conflict all the time and who remind you there's this whole big wonderful wide world out there um, and so those tend to be my my two go-to's talking with friends and being in the classroom as you can see conflict photography is more than just a captivating image it's ethics it's morality it's mental health and it can be deadly Remember that the next time you see an image that captures your heart.